Hello, and welcome to a very special Sunderland Museum event, The Blue Lamp Remembered, featuring Rachel Kushner. The Sunderland Museum is open uh, 10 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, with neighborhood walking tours every Saturday at 1. And like many of you, I was very excited to read the hard card essay by Rachel Kushner that was first published in The New Yorker and has now been released in its entirety as part of a collection of essays. Rachel writes about the Tenderloin in her fiction and reading the hard crowd, you really get a sense of the Tenderloin landscape she draws from to create her fiction. We're also very happy Rachel shined a bright light on the blue lamp. We knew very little about the blue lamp until Rachel wrote about her experiences bartending there. The more we looked into the blue lamp, the more we found out it was one of the most interesting under the radar places from the city's past. The eclectic crowd of the blue lamp is emblematic of the Tenderloin itself, and it's an incredible encapsulation of the Tenderloin in the 80s and 90s, as well as the San Francisco music scene at that time. First, we're going to hear an excerpt of our interview with Rachel. The full interview will be available on our YouTube page, so be sure to subscribe. And in Act 2, we're going to hear a collection of interviews with other Blue Lamb characters. So let's get this rolling. Enjoy. I describe working at the Blue Lamp uh, as a bartender in two of the essays that are in my new book, The Hard Crowd, the title essay and another essay called Not With The Band uh, that's about bartending at various live music venues all around San Francisco. Um, I work at the Warfield and Fillmore and the Great American Music Hall and um, the Longshoremen's Hall, um, the Trocadero, which was also uh, for a period of time called the Bridge. A bunch of different places that once you're in that circuit of doing live music, you get asked to do this, that, and the other thing. But you have to learn first how to be a bartender. And it's not just pouring drinks and handling a crowd and figuring out how to make eye contact with people, let them know that they're gonna be attended too soon, you know, when, the, when there's like a busy night at the bar, but also just sort of embodying the personality of the bartender, which is kind of the person in the room who sets the tone and the rules. You're like, in a certain way, you're like the president, yeah. uh, but you're the president of the bar. And um, my first bartending job was at the Blue Lamp, which, you know, in a way is really on the outside border of the Tenderloin, Tender Knob. It's on Geary, right? Between Taylor and Jones. Um, but it was part of a social ecology that came up from the Tenderloin very much. Um, many of the regulars there were people who lived in the single resident occupancy hotels. Um, on Geary and also below there, you know, on Leavenworth, the streets around there. And people would come into the bar, sometimes in their pajamas, um, because they lived that close by. And it was a sort of living room where yeah. people could congregate. And it also comprised sort of like one locus on what I mentioned in the book as a circuit of bars in the Tenderloin. And so even as I was stationary, because I was there pouring drinks, some of my regulars coming in had just been at the Driftwood. They'd just been at the Coral Sea or Joan L's or Cinnabar. And now some of my memories of these places have faded somewhat, but at the time, these bars start to take up residence in your imagination, even if you aren't regular there yourself, because your regulars who spend their whole life in bars, and let's just bracket like the subject of alcoholism for a minute. This is still a real cultural history and social world of people who live um, in these places and they all know one another. Yeah. And I think maybe one important aspect of that is that um, people had credit at these bars as they did at the Blue Lamp. And I think that there was a sense of community and sympathy and compassion for regulars understanding that people were gonna get their check at a certain date. So they could drink on credit until that date and be safe and be inside. And um, it's a bit cheers-like, I guess, but truly I did know everybody's name. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the Tenderloin has so many like kind of public living rooms because the SROs don't have them. Um, and yeah, there's a real sense of camaraderie and supporting each other and um, sense of family for sure. But also like a pretty specific set of social mores and rules that yeah. I- Oh, absolutely. There's had, like a code. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of codes that I had to learn and um, I was really interested in learning them. I think that lifelong I've been the kind of person who takes a certain enjoyment in the challenge of being kind of suddenly plunged into an environment where the codes that you need to learn to excel in that environment to do well are not things that you can read about in books or have quickly explained to you you have to absorb them like the social codes were finely nuanced in a lot of ways. And I kind of loved being the, I don't know, the, the unschooled one who other people took pleasure in explaining things to, or even if they were dismissive to me, which they were, um, I liked that because I wanted to learn from them and for them to be the experts at their world to which I was being initiated. Yeah. Um, well, if you could just give a sense of like what it was like to be there for someone like me that didn't ever get to go, um, like, you know, what were like the most popular drinks and how many nights were there live music and things like that? Sure. Well, maybe I could start out by saying like, um, so when I got my job um, at the Blue Lamp, a woman named Ramona Downey was the bar manager. And um, I walked into that bar on an unseasonably hot day in San Francisco. And we know how rare those are. And when it's a hot day in San Francisco, it feels like something really special is going to happen, either to you or generally. And that special thing could be cataclysmic, like an earthquake. Or it could simply be that you meet your destiny in the form of a new life as a bartender in the tender knob. And on a very hot day in San Francisco, I went downtown looking for a job with, you know, my just silly resume. I had very little um, experience doing anything. I had a college degree. There was a global recession. It was maybe like 1991. And um, it was hard to find employment. The other problem with finding employment for me was that I didn't really want a job. Um, I didn't want regular job. And I ducked out of the sunlight and into the darkness of this bar. And there was a woman behind the bar wearing a fedora with a feather in it. And I felt like I had stepped into not a specifically different era. I didn't know what year it felt like in that bar, but a different plane of reality. And I immediately fell in love with the place. And I asked Ramona um, if she was hiring. And I don't think she was, but she said, we will try you out, we'll try you out. And um, my first shift there was the morning shift. I don't remember what time it started, but pretty early, at least for me. So when I got to the bar and the Swamper Jerry was unlocking the doors to let people in, there were already people waiting outside. <laughs> and those were people I think who were biding their time with package liquor between the time that a uh, bar stopped serving at 2 a.m. 1.45 and the time when bars in that neighborhood would open again. Um, so people were a little shaky and kind of in a rush to get their drinks but they also were perfectly fine telling me how to make their drinks. So the morning shift was like a great place to be in the laboratory of learning. And they all drank different things. Um, you know, there was a guy who drank Galliano. And do you remember what Galliano is in a huge tall bottle, almost like, like the pepper grinder at an old fashioned Italian restaurant or the olive oil bottle you see on the wall that never gets opened. It was four feet tall. Maybe Galliano is in a Harvey Wallbanger. 
I can't remember. I sometimes have anxiety dreams where I'm being asked to bartend now. And I can't remember how to make the drinks. Moreover, the drinks that people make now are much more complicated. Um, but even for me then, you know, people would say, grab the bottle by the neck and turn it upside down, you know, pull up and then pull down. And that is one shot. These things you have to learn. And then once you know them, you feel like an athlete or something because it's a very, it's a physical job and to do it well and pour drinks quickly, you have to be in control of your body and have balance and all this stuff. Anyway, so I started out in the morning and um, it was just me and the bar back, Jerry. And so it was a quiet time at the bar um, and I really cherished it. Um, and then eventually they started letting me bartend at night. You have to be more seasoned to do that. It's busier. Um, Ramona, I believe was the one who instituted the entire tradition of having live music at the Blue Lamp. There may have been a blues jam that preceded her, but I'm not certain about that. By the time I got there, she was doing, she was the booking manager and doing live music at night. And it was still relatively new such that there was this kind of like witching hour uh, between the late afternoon regulars, like the hardcore tenderloin crowd and the people who were coming for live music. And it was different every night, the crowd, depending on who was booked there. You know, we had like we had metal bands, we had punk bands, we had uh, some kind of like classic big bands like Levee Smith and her Red Hot Skillet Liquors. Um, we had like old timey music. Um, with skiffle drum and instruments and you know so it just depends on the night but um that crowd was always going to be a different crowd than the regulars and the two of them meeting it was it's almost like the freshwater outlet to the sea and this strange <laughs> like brackish mix but in a certain way they understood each other and you would see like my regular rick who drank bacardi 151 and pushed a walker and just quite frankly fell down a lot and was like a very serious alcoholic. Him sort of telling somebody to get out of his way who was like a hipster with purple hair. Um, it was just a funny mix of people who kind of tolerated one another. And by the end of the night, sometimes if it was a really rocking band, there were people dancing and the regulars were dancing with these like hipsters from the mission who were there to see their friends band play. Yeah, that reminds me so much of Ann Charlie's, which is my favorite Tenderloin bar where I'm a regular. And there's the afternoon Tenderloin crowd and then people that come for the drag show. And it's so fun to be part of both crowds and then to see some of the regulars. Sometimes they leave, but sometimes they stick around for the show. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, uh, the people that like put on the show like and some of the younger younger crowd like love the elders and like are, are very like excited when they stay and there's like a real camaraderie and respect there yeah. i mean that happens sometimes but there was now i'm remembering a little more i mean gosh i wish i had a camera and could watch the scenes i saw as bartender because every night it was an epic movie that I somehow got to participate in and watch. But sometimes there was camaraderie and sometimes there was frustration. Like the regulars from the daytime were just like, who the hell are all these people? And why do I have to wait to get a drink in my own bar? And sometimes there was a strange um, overlapping of two different planes of reality that almost seemed not to be able to talk to each other. Like the regulars didn't even see what was going on. They would just push their way to the bar and sit down and have a drink. I mean, I had some regulars in there who had been going to that bar for years and years and years and were just such extreme personalities. Always Like he had just learned that word. <laughs> okay. um, so in the hard crowd, you write, I never wrote about most people from the blue lamp. The bar is gone. The main characters have died. Um, and we've already talked about it a bit, um, but who were those main characters 
and you, you write about some of them, you know, Tommy and Bobby and Jer and Johnny. Um, and are there any like main characters from the Blue Lamp that, that did not make it into the hard crowd and why? Oh, many. I mean, there's so many people from that time. And one thing that I mentioned in the book, you know, in regard to this is that I've never written about the Blue Lamp. Um, I mean, it's kind of mentioned glancingly in my most recent novel, The Mars Room. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's not totally accurate to say I've never written about it, but I've really never dug into that world and my experience there as the bartender. And I was trying to reflect on why that is. And as I say, maybe it's because I'm not finished sort of sorting and tallying what that experience was. I think that writers, by the time they turn to a subject, there's some distance that is installed in the act of writing. And I maybe wasn't ready to install that distance. Um, I want to mention maybe if it's okay, just to add um, about, about the people who came in there. Um, because I'm from the city, I also ran into people there uh, from my own childhood and life. And it was sort of like, like if you're looking for people, there's the ethos of staying in one place so they can find you rather than moving around so that you can find each other. And, you know, as bartender, you're in one place. So the streams of people that would pass through just the transience of it, you know, depending on who's playing or what's happening in that person's life, people would come and go like they're moving through the city on their own geometry. And I'm here in this one point. And, um, so for instance, like a friend of mine from childhood uh, would come in a lot because she'd ended up living in the Tenderloin and was working the streets and what had been my best friend. So there I was for her um, in this different guise and she could come in and we could hang out there. Um, then I also had friends, we'd all gone to junior high together. I had other friends from junior high, Herbert Hoover Middle School, class of whatever, 1981. Um, <laughs> uh, I had other friends from junior high who became quite serious musicians. Um, like there's a bass player named Dana Schechter and she had different bands. Now she's in the Black Swans and um, another couple of bands, very like well-known celebrated musician. And, they would come in and she was playing with this guy Rick who we all went to junior high together and they were these really cool musicians and it just kind of makes you feel like oh there's um I don't know a coherent history here and community and it includes this place. I was the booking manager for a, a time after so Ramoni Downey who'd hired me and was the original booking manager and really she was the impresario who kind of made the Blue Lamp into something a bit more than just one more bar uh, in that circuit. She left to start her own club, Bottom of the Hill, which I believe is still is. in operation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I took over that job at a certain point. Um, I think I was kind of more excited about having this cool business card that said, you know, Blue Lamp, Rachel Kushner, booking manager, call 863-BLUE. Then I was about the actual responsibilities of the job because you had to be kind of detail-oriented, administrative, and secretarial to do a good job. I don't think I was that great at that. It was also a bit stressful because it was on you if somehow you didn't follow up and confirm with the band. Um, and if you leave a night open and there's no band, then the bartender working that night is going to make like one tenth of what they were counting on making. So everybody is relying on you to keep, you know, keep business flowing through the blue lamp. Um, but uh, I don't know, um, some bands were really happy to play there other bands, maybe they didn't have a good experience there and you couldn't get them to come back. So it was neat just to see the people who were who were interested in 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 the Blue Lamp. Um, so I think I only had that job for about a year. 
I probably took it on because you got an extra salary for doing it. I mean, I needed the money. I was broke. Um, but to be honest, I sort of just preferred being the bartender who got to work the good shifts, which is like Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, yeah. than, than being the, the booking manager. But I did do that for a while. Well, business card's beautiful. I have a matchbook too of the blue lamp I can show you as well. Um, I heard that you have a matchbook. Maybe my yeah. cousin Katie forwarded me that. I can, uh, here we go. <laughs> that's the one we have that's in our matchbook book. Oh, wow. I mean, that may have preceded my time there. I don't remember I think, it, but it's I think beautiful. it's pretty old based on this old kind of phone number. Um, well, that, so the light motif of the lamp that's on the right, that was on the sign that hung over the door. Yeah, that sign is beautiful. Um, yeah, we actually did have, um, so the first third of the hard crowd is framed through a right down Market Street. Um, uh, which is a video that we cherish at the Tenderloin Museum as evidence of the wealth of neon in San Francisco. It's actually San Francisco Neon is our, um, we're their fiscal sponsor and they're the ones that put that video on YouTube. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And the Blue Lamp had a beautiful neon sign. And um, what would you say is uh, neon's impact on the aesthetic of the bar or how it kind of colors your memories or experiences there? Um, or like how does a neon sign or matchbook evoke history? Um, or if there are any other kinds of objects and relics like that that you think more evoke the Blue Lamb's history? Yeah. Um, I think we had a neon sign inside the bar also, but yes. my memory of it is hazy. Probably seeing that neon sign from outside is what made me want to go into the place. I mean, just growing up in San Francisco, I was somebody who felt like there was great mystery to be discovered in places that advertise themselves with neon. Um, as I say in the book, neon is a noble gas, whatever else that means, it suits that, that stretch of film um, traveling down Market Street there is a certain nobility and mystery to neon. I mean, even in the kind of, I guess more like frumpy inner sunset of the late seventies and early eighties, there was some neon that felt like the way it glows in the fog is sort of special. Um, I don't know about other aesthetics um, of the bar itself. I mean, I wish I could see more photos of the interior to remind me. We did not have a piano, even though, you know, we were called the Blue Lamp Piano Bar. And um, there had originally been a piano in that bar, but it had been gone for a long time by the time um, I worked there. That's incredible. Um... I, I myself am really fascinated by like the life experiences people draw from to write fiction and reading the hard crowd, you really get a sense that you drew from the landscape of the Tenderloin to create fiction, particularly the Mars room. Um, and as someone who loves both the Tenderloin and your writing, that was extremely exciting. And I'm curious about if the characters in your novels are based off of specific people in the essays or there's specific incidences that made it into your novels, or if it's more of an amalgamation of people and experiences? I think the, these are great questions. Um, I tend to write people who are more amalgamations and invented and almost conventionalize parts of my own personality, parts of personalities of people I've admired and are nothing like me, um, drifts of experience that I've had. The Mars Room, I would say, has the most life that is intimate to my own experience in it. Um, because it's fiction and should stand as that, I'm a bit hesitant to sort of, you know, make a schema of like, oh, so this part is based on this and that part's based on that real thing. But when you read it, you know, it conjures 
the sunset and also civic center and the tenderloin in a way that is true to my experience and really precedes um, my adulthood when I was working at the Blue Lab. I mean, I moved to San Francisco at the age of 10, so I'm not a native native, um, but maybe in a certain sense, having the place be alien to me allowed me to see it in a particular way. And like, you know, the first week of school in sixth grade, I became friends with a girl who asked me to go down to Civic Center with her to find her much older half sister, who frankly uh, was working the streets down there. And so my introduction to the Tenderloin came very early. Um, and then as a teenager, a girl on my blog who was a good friend got a job at that Kentucky Fried Chicken on Eddy Street. Um, I think it's Eddy and Taylor, is that right? Um, There's still one at like Eddy and Polk about, but. Maybe not at the corner. I think it's the same one. Um, I think it's still there as, and I mentioned that in the essay in the book and I say it gets withering Yelp reviews, but what, do, <laughs> but what do people expect? You know, I mean, it's kind of sweet in a way that they are reviewing the KFC on Eddie and they're upset about the customer service there, the etiquette or that the napkins that haven't been refilled. Um, my friend Jeannie worked at that KFC and you know, kind of like when you work at those places, you get a feel for the neighborhood. I mean, if being a bartender is like being the president of the bar, even if you're at a fast food venue, which I've worked at many myself, um, you're kind of, you're the person who's setting the tone in the room. There isn't like a security guard, you know, you have to deal with people and what goes on in the neighborhood and you become friends with regulars and et cetera. So I was kind of introduced to that world through her. Yeah, so um, you write, to be hard is to let things roll off of you, to live in the present, not to dwell or worry. Why write about the hard crowd? How is grasping at the hard, the fleeting, in the present history that exists in the Tenderloin uh, shaped your worldview and your craft? Well, it's not writing about it that's shaped my worldview. It's that um, I write about my own life and the people I've known. Um, I, I think it's hard to quantify these things, but people are like movie stars to me. I mean, just regular people in my life. I've always been kind of drawn to exciting people and maybe I've just been rich in that, in that I've encountered a lot of really interesting people. And, um, it's not like I sought out the quote unquote hard crowd, um, I, you know, I just I'm from the city and um, there's a world that I lived in and had a part in and was also an observer to that I'm starting to realize more and more is somewhat unique. And um, I say that based on the reactions that I got to that essay when it was excerpted in a magazine and a lot of people who read it reached out to me and said, wow, you really did it. Like, thank you for telling my story also, because it is a time and a cast of characters and a feeling and a world that's sort of unbelievable to people who didn't live it. So those of us who did live it actually stopped talking about it to people who didn't because they don't understand what you're saying. And sometimes they even think you're making it up. So why bother? Um, but when I have total control, like I did with that essay and kind of caught the stream of this feeling of tallying and sorting what's completely vanished, but still occupies a pretty big role in my own thoughts and experiences just in the daily, um, it, was, it was satisfying to figure out a way to make that into uh, an essay. But like in terms of there being a hard crowd, it, I like that phrase. Um, it comes from a cream song, White Room, that I listened to a lot as a kid. I heard it from older people who ran this head shop on Hay Street called The White Rabbit. Um, so sometimes these things just become nodes in your own mind of how to like 
define things later or put a sort of envelope around a feeling and a time. And I met a lot of different people uh, growing up who I would consider to be hard. Um, and hard doesn't, it's not a pejorative at all, but it's also not a kind of romanticizing. It just, my favorite phrase lately is it is what it is. Cause I, you know, I, I don't know how else to say things sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the Tenderloin Museum is dedicated to Tenderloin history. And I mean, I would say that the hard crowd is also an essay on Tenderloin history in that it's nonfiction that takes place in the Tenderloin in the past. And museum really strives to give voice to people and places that are often left out of history books and to tell more of their personal stories as opposed to what you'd read in, in headlines. And do you feel like Tenderloin history is important and why? Oh, so important, yes. I mean, the more we talk, the more I wish I could remember all the details of the various people I've known over the years um, who also you know, can claim a share in that history, but it's a very vital part of the city. I mean, you know, I'm not the expert on this, but there were a lot of um, really vibrant immigrant communities that took residence in the Tenderloin too, Vietnamese people, Laotian people, Cambodian people, um, you know, so that if you just land in the city, it's a place where you can afford um, something to rent. And also, in the first wave of the dot-com era in the 90s, I left San Francisco around that time and moved to New York City. And that was, you know, people were really pushed out of housing. So it was very swift. And I, many friends of mine could seek refuge in the Tenderloin because it was still um, affordable. I would like to think that places like the Blue Lamb and maybe like this speaks of a generalized phenomenon in the Tenderloin is that it is a community that in its own way is about safe harbor. There are places in the Tenderloin where people can go and feel accepted and safe that is not offered to them in any other part of the city. I mean, there were people who came into the Blue Lamp who I would like to think were offered safe harbor there. Um, but when I say safe harbor, I'm also acknowledging that there was great danger to these people in and outside of the Tenderloin, but that some of the businesses and community resources in the Tenderloin could work to protect people. There was a woman who was a regular to my shifts uh, at the bar at the Blue Lamb who was transgender and um, would come in in the afternoon and had a kind of exquisite poise to her. Like she was Kim Novak. She was my Kim Novak in the 90s. And you know, San Francisco was really very proudly, I think, at the vanguard of like new gender politics. And um, we were all versed in that and blessed and early. So, you know, to me, it was completely normal to have this glamorous woman sitting at the bar, but I also saw her um, experience great violence. And it's painful to think about, but when she came into the bar, it was a safe harbor for her. And same with my friend, Thomas Wanger, who ended up murdered. I would like to think that the bar was safe harbor for him. And that maybe that the Tenderloin is about that in a sense, in terms of its community resources, it's about accepting people and providing them dignity and safety. Absolutely. It has throughout its entire history as well, been a safe haven for those that don't fit into society's mainstream and lots of different incarnations. And it's also the people have fought for their right to exist um, from you know, the powers that be throughout its entire history. And that's a history we really showcase at the museum. And anytime you're in the Tenderloin, please, please come by. We'd love to have you. I will. I will take you up on that offer soon. And anytime you want to go to Aunt Charlie's also, or Janelle's is still open, let me know. Let's do it together. Hi everyone, we're back. 
<laughs> Thank you so much to Rachel Kushner for taking the time to do that interview with us. Again, the uh, entire interview will be available on our YouTube page and we'll share that um, with everyone. And thanks to Rachel for introducing us to the Blue Lamp as well. Alex? Yeah, um, Act Two uh, is gonna be um, a handful of condensed Zoom interviews with some of the people that Rachel uh, mentioned in her interview with us and who were you know, pretty central to the Blue Lamp Bar during that period, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and we'll hear a little more from Rachel as well. We're gonna hear from Ramona Downey, uh, the, book, the booker uh, of the Blue Lamp and Kathleen Owen, who worked there with her. Uh, and the two of them went on to start Bottom of the Hill. Uh, we're gonna hear from uh, Patrick Archer, who was uh, the bass player in the Blues Jam and uh, sound, sound engineer at the Blue Lamp for a long time. Uh, we're gonna hear from Ginger Coyote, founder and editor of Punk Globe uh, and front, front person of the White Trash Debutantes uh, rollicking band. Uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Lucky, Pierre, uh, who is a, a lounge singer, beloved lounge singer in San Francisco and uh, a private investigator, PI. We're going to hear from one of his bandmates, Mike Jaffe, uh, who musician, also a private investigator. Uh, and then finally, we're going to hear from LeVay Smith and Chris Siebert who uh, uh, we have a bunch of great pictures of and who you know are musicians that have played in, in the Bay for a few decades now and, uh, and are still playing uh, currently, even during these sort of strange inter-pandemic times. Yeah, so this event is a showcase of the oral histories and ephemera that we've collected so far. But if you have a story to tell about the Blue Lamp or photos, video, and ephemera, let us know. We're still interested and we're still collecting. And um, you know, it's an it's an evolving project. One um, one of the people, uh, somebody who shared a few photos already. We've been hearing all sorts of stories and, and stuff in like comments on social media pages and just over email and from talking to all these people. And Lavey's uh, sister. Uh, Catherine Miller, Cat Miller, uh, emailed some photos in the other day that are just incredible uh, of when she worked at the bar and took some photos of patrons. I think this this fellow is called Stan. Uh, you can see the chandelier. And Vic Jones, <laughs> the the uh, uh, guitar player. Yeah, the chandelier. The chandelier came up frequently in uh, interviews as a, a memorable feature of the bar. Always uh, covered in dust. Never been dusted chandeliers. Um, so uh, thanks to Kat for reaching out. She has a really cool uh, uh, body of work and a lot of it's on her, her Instagram, Tinderline photos uh, from your and otherwise. Uh, but yeah, if anybody else has any photos or videos or you know a, a cool, interesting story, just some history about the bar. Um, we've heard, heard about it existing as the Blue Lamp back into the 50s, Patrick talked about finding the ashtray from like 1950s. We've seen some photos from around that time, but um, yeah, uh, please be in touch. Info at tenderlandmuseum.org. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we'll, uh, shall we go to act two? Yes, let's. <laughs> Thanks awesome. everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm Katie, by the way. Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Thanks so I much. Something that Bobby gave me. Can you see this? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> there it is. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So he's, uh, he, he made a bunch of those for his vehicle, for his truck and stuff. And then he gave me one. And it's usually on my refrigerator at home because it's magnetic. So. <laughs> Was that on the building or something? That is, I think, you know, because Bobby was always, he was a sailor. And I think that's a buoy that's a buoy. on the water with the blue lamp, with the light. Or a lighthouse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it looks like it's on a buoy, doesn't it? It like, does. Yeah. yeah. For those of us who didn't get to go, like, what was the blue lamp like? Like, what was the vibe, the decor? Um, 
And um, I came to the, my impression of the blue lamp, I had worked at the Hotel de Utah, which opened in the 40s, the mid 40s, and its back bar came around the Cape and it had all this history. I didn't really consider the, uh, the Hotel Utah a dive bar, but when I first walked into the blue lamp, I was like, oh, okay. Because I had quit the Hotel Utah bartending. I just needed, a, it was my first bartending job and I didn't know if I wanted to bartend. And it was, and so I saw so Karen, someone said to me, you know, Karen ask if you were interested in booking the blue lamp, she's going to be leaving. And Karen had been at night break. And, and my first impression was I looked at the fabric on the wall, you know, that red uh, okay. brocade yeah. fabric. And they, in front of the bar was linoleum. And then uh, maybe it sat like 12 or 14 people, as you probably know. And then the other side with the old red carpeting and tables and chairs. And I talked to Bobby and he's like, um, he would call bands outfits. So what kind of outfits do you look? I said, this is an outfit. You know, that is a band is a better music, you know, musicians are a band and we would laugh about it. But um, I said to him, yeah, let's give it a try. I'll come in, I'll bartend and I'll, I'll bring, you know, I, I know a lot of bands from the Hotel Utah and I'm sure they'd like to come here and play because, you know, the Tenderloin is a unique place and anybody who lived in San Francisco for any length of time kind of knew it. And I think it's dive bar, bariness was kind of attractive where you would, you could sit down on a bar stool beside somebody who was, in their 70s or 80s who was on a pension or you know hadn't or you could sit down beside a musician or you know some character that had probably gone down to Macy's and shoplift some clothes that still had the tags on that wanted to sell them to you so it was you know. also mixed with I think like um because there's a lot of nice hotels around there we would get that mix of of people would be like the tenderloin crowd and then the hotel and theater crowd, right? Mm -hmm. They would come in too. And also you did mention how dark and smoky. <laughs> was, uh, everybody smoked and um, it was so smoky. And um, I mean, it didn't bother me because at the time I smoked them. Um, but, and the uh, um, red velvet curtains. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the piano. Mm -hmm. And the piano took up like half the room. Right. Like a third of the room. So, but it, I mean, how many people would, um, wasn't it like 80 people? I think tops. I think you would be shoulder to shoulder if there was 80 people in there. Yeah. But that was a lot. So, I mean, in the hard crowd, Rachel Krishner describes this like informal tenderloin circuit of bars. Um, what place would you say that the blue lamp um, held in that um, t informal tenderloin circuit? Or like what kind of character did it lend to the neighborhood? How is it different from kind of the other other bars there? I think it was very similar, but yet it, because it had music, yeah. it was different. And the night it, crowd anyways. The night crowd was, yeah. Day crowd, I think was pretty similar to most of the other Tenderloin bars. But I mean, the bands that we brought in brought their whole, uh, their, you know, a whole circle of friends that, you know, I think was interesting to the Tenderloin crowd. And then people would come just to check it out. like oh, there's some music coming out of there. It sounds interesting. And also we would get people that would go to the Great American Music Hall for shows and then would be like, let's walk over to the Blue Lamp and have a drink, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like this mix of people and kind of like pulling space for like a bunch of different communities is kind of what made it special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like and the crowd changed like depending on the band. Like she said, like the, the bands brought um, their following and that might be like, rockabilly maybe or, or mm -hmm. hardcore punk or more of the bluesy crowd um it was really fun and there's only a couple times that i worked in the daytime like covering um i mean i was cocktail and then i started bartending right away because somebody left so um and then um i somebody wanted me to cover their bar shift during the day and um i was that was scary to me. Like I said, I was, it was all new to me. And um, it was like, oh, holy shit, you know, like it was hardcore actually. So when uh, Rachel talks about that in her um, articles, um, what she, everything she says about the blue lamp, like, 
um, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I could relate to, she knows more details. She must've started right when we left. Mm -hmm. So early nineties. Yes. And, uh, no, 91. Yeah. Yeah. It was 91. 91. Yeah. Cause we started. So mm -hmm. it was like, cause, um, I don't remember her. I didn't meet her. So she had to have started like right when we left, but, um, and she knows some of those things about the, the head in the trash can or something. Yeah. Did you know that? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Tell them the one story though about the one guy, or no, the guy in the car. No. Oh well, one memorable <laughs> story I have is I was bartending a couple shifts, and you know, new people would come in all the time, and this kid, this guy came in, and I thought he was super cute, and he came in a couple times, and he asked me if I wanted to go out, and I was just you know playing it cool, and then. One night he's like, hey, you know, do you like fast cars? And I was like, yeah, I do. And he's like, you want to go for a ride after work? And I was like, sure. So he pulls up in this yellow Camaro and I had, we, Bobby and I had closed up and he's like, you want to go across the Golden, let's go for a ride across the Golden Gate Bridge. So we went tearing up Gary Street and we go to make that turn on Lombard where the Safeway might still be. And he's like, the back end, he takes it really fast and the back end's like, spinning out he's losing control and the next thing you know we're on the sidewalk almost up against this telephone pole and uh, without I mean before I could even think about what had happened he's running he's like into the marina he's gone I can't even see him anymore and I realized he had stolen the car and he was just gone and so I had to like go back to you know walk back and I left it the car too <clears throat> it was still on um, left it and like had to find my way back to the blue land where my car was and get home. <laughs> That's pretty badass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just heard that story like for the first time, you know, so in all these years, I'm like, oh, you never told me that. So. Um, that was something I didn't encounter in Santa Barbara, you know. And there was this one character who I loved. Uh, I would get there to set up the bar earlier than Kathleen would arrive. <laughs> And there were, you know, as you know, in that area, there's a lot of hotels that people stay Residential. In, yes. Residential hotels. There, what, there were. And, you know, there were a lot of people who would come in that in the first of the month, they had just got their check and they would drink like fish. And then by the end of the month, they were asking, you know, could you front me a beer? I don't have any money. But there was this one gentleman, his name was Larry, and he was so cute. He was probably in his eighties and he used to come in and do the soft shoe on with his hat and, and cane on the linoleum part in front of the bar because he couldn't do it on the other side because that had carpeting. And so he didn't have like tap shoes on, but he would tap across the, and the, you know, entertain everybody for a few minutes and then he would leave and he didn't even drink. And he, he just was a character that was, you know, like that's obviously he had a dance background and he liked to do that and he wasn't an alcoholic. And he would just come in very often early in the evening while I was setting up and there'd be maybe four people in the bar and he would do a soft shoe across the linoleum, tip his hat and then he would leave. So I really liked him. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, it, why did you love the blue lamp? If you did love it. Me, I'll say I loved her, number one. Oh, that, I mean, so from sweet. the get go, from the get go. I mean, I just talked about her constantly, like, and she's still my idol, my mentor. Um, and I loved, um, that was my first job in the city. And it really, um, I'm glad it was there and not at like the Marriott or something like that. Cause I really got, uh, you know, I got caught up really fast and say, it felt like, oh, I learned a lot <clears throat> in that year. Plus, um, I got paid under the table. Can I see that? <laughs> yes. um, so it was just like easy money, quick, easy money. And, um, and never knew what, you know, it wasn't humdrum, boring. Not like every night was different and um, you never knew what was going to happen. So it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. So, yeah. And I, I, I loved it for the little over two years that I was there too. I don't think I ever planned on staying very long. I mean, I knew it was just, it was, it was attractive because it was a dive bar and I really liked Bobby. I mean, I, we used to go he loved to too. his, he had a, <clears throat> he had a house on Berryessa, on Lake Berryessa. 
and he would say, why don't you grab some girls and me, you know, we'll go up to Lake Berryessa and go swimming. And, you know, for Bobby, who was a little bit older than us, I'm sure he enjoyed, you know, we'd sit around his, around the lake and around his house and just talk and relax. <clears throat> so I really thought he was such a character from the minute I met him, you know, with his shoes and his hat and um, his, what's this outfit going to be like tonight? Yeah. You know? <laughs> So yeah, it, and just the, the eclecticness of the crowd, you know, of the people who would come. And Bobby always remembered their name and he was always um, interested in what, they, you know, would talk to them. He wasn't like um, an owner that just sat in his office counting all of his money doing lines of blow every night, you know, or something like that. So it was definitely like a, like a um, kind of a close family type thing in a way, you know. I don't remember ever having to kick anybody out. I mean, it no. was- And we didn't have any security either, exactly. you know, but they would respect us, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. If you asked them to leave, they would leave. And it was, I think, a very welcoming place for sure. Yeah. It was the kind of place that you didn't feel judged. You know, it wasn't highbrow. So you didn't have to dress up to go in there. And if you wanted to talk to somebody, you could. And if you didn't, you could just sit there people would leave you alone or, you know, they would converse with you, you know. I think it was a good place to go with somebody if you were having an affair, because <laughs> there was no windows. I mean, there were a couple, <laughs> and it was like, it was all dark, you open the curtains and you walk in the front door and um, um, uh, the blue lamp was like off, off the beaten track and, you know, um, but once they were there, everybody loved it. I don't know anybody that said anything you know, I mean, I'm sure they had, you know, might have been creeped out or scared or something out front, but, um, um, you know, it's the punkers, they were like, yeah, this is what it's all about. It was cheap. cheap. Everybody loves a good dive bar. And yeah. it, it was a dive bar. You know, yeah. Like and there was way. no security. We had no security, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a guy that hung out there that worked the door and, um, yeah. So it wasn't like, yeah, there's no, it was, you could get away with, and he, it was fun and like when the band everybody was when the band was playing and singing like if they knew the words the whole place was saying it I mean everybody just felt like they were all in on it, you know some of the people that I think about a lot from the blue lamp are the guys who played in the Sunday afternoon blues jam that was a kind of special group of people um the leader of that blues jam, I believe his name was Bobby. He was charming and also kind of impossible, um, very much of an egoist. And he had this cordless electric guitar that um, he sometimes utilized the freedom of that to run outside and perform his solo uh, on Geary Street in front of the bar he did that once in the pouring rain and came back in and said, I shocked the hell out of myself because he's playing an electric guitar in the rain. Um, his bass player was named Patrick and Patrick had a girlfriend or wife named Maureen and they were my regulars. And I often wonder what happened to them. Um, they were very cool people. Uh, Patrick reminded me of like, he was like a Tom Waits, but not famous, you know? And maybe in the way that like, Tom Waits is very distinct and special for a lot of reasons, but among them that he is a kind of meta Tom Waits and he's also very much Tom Waits in the sense that he's kind of performing the role of this sort of cultural character who's seen everything and has a kind of, you know, like, rough street poetry quality to him, but he's also outside of that. So there's a knowingness to it. And like Patrick from the Blues Jam was kind of like our very local version of that. He was handsome and glamorous and soulful, like he should have been famous. Okay. Yeah, Patrick Archer is my name. I'm currently living in Lucerne, Switzerland. I did. I was very much tenderloin. I've always loved the tenderloin. I don't know why there's a strange attraction there. Um, 
I was born in San Mateo, raised in Sunnyvale, left in 1974, a couple of years in New York, a few years in Utah touring. And then I came back to, I wanted to move back to San Francisco. My car broke down on Hyde and Post. So that's how I ended up in San Francisco. <laughs> And I just took to it. Uh, I just took to it. I loved it. You could ask, because you're in Switzerland with your wife, who you met at the Blue Lamp. Yeah. Can... On, a Monday, on a Monday night, acoustic night, she walked in. I just finished my set, and I walked up to her and introduced myself. And, and that was that? Her, that was that. Wow. And what I brought mean... her to the Blue Lamp? She, she just, on a, <laughs> on a Monday was... night, to hear some acoustic yeah. music. She did a work exchange program uh, with the Swiss Trade Service and United Airlines. So she went to work for United. And our doorman, uh, Dave, at the time, was hustling customers in. It was a Monday night. They come on in and he hustled her in. Wow. And, and here I am, three children later, living in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you first hear about the Blue Lamp? And, uh, and when did you start going? This, uh, Rachel's article brought back such a flood of memories I hadn't thought about much. But it, it all starts, uh, I was living at the Gaylord Hotel at 620 uh, Jones Street. And my, my room was facing south and we, I could see the blue lamp, which previously had just been a dive bar for old pensioners. But we started hearing music coming out of there. And so we went in and met Ramona. And so she, I, I started doing sound for her for the band, and she was she was really turning this place into something special. Um, I always hold Ramona in high regard for what she did there. And, and then I proposed to her uh, Sunday afternoon jam is what it started out to be, which then we started that I think, I mean eighty nine. I remember it was around the time of the earthquake, and it became so successful we moved it to the night, and it just kept going and going and going. To get a, a, a lot of, I, I went through several host bands. I had the Blue Reptiles there, which was my band for a while. Um, I had a guy when I started out named Joe Stewart, and I don't know where he is this, to this day, but he was a brilliant uh, guitar player, singer, and harmonica player, but just a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, we'd go out and do gigs, and they'd go over well, and then he'd piss off the owners, and we'd never get hired back again. So anyway, I went through a lot of musicians. We had a lot of great people coming into play. Well, we started tapping into the L.A. crowd coming up, getting movie stars and musicians. We had Lemmy get a blues jam with us one night. And still to this day, I, I show my face to my friends and I go, Lemmy plays that face. And here in <laughs> Switzerland, people think that's important. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Tork of the Monkeys was a regular and a sweetheart, a lovely man. And... Um, Billy Gibbs was in there. He did not jam. Um, I remember Kuiper Sutherland coming in with his entourage. It seems like the actors always had to have entourages. Um, and my greatest honor was meeting and playing in front of uh, John McHooker when he came in. I remember talking to my friend uh, Jake, Jake Sampson, the bass player that I admired very much, and he was on the gig that night. And I see John Lee Hooker walking in with a beautiful young woman on his charm. I asked Jake, I said, that's got to be his daughter. I mean, it's like, going, nah. <laughs> Things like that happened. We had one guy that would come into the jam, and he had his one glove, and uh, he always did Mustang Sally. He'd come in, we'd see him, we knew how to get him right up, and he'd go up and do an amazing Mustang Sally. The crowd would go wild, and then he'd leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I recall on those nights, uh, I had to maintain a list to uh, tell people to sign up. We ended up going from 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock or 1 to 1.30. Wow. Because we had so many jammers, we were going to 40 to 50 musicians in a night. Wow. And we were, we, it, so it was an organizational nightmare, but it would, you just had to be totally on the whole night. Make sure everybody gets up. Make sure the quality of music is good. One thing I learned there is if you have bad music for 10 minutes you'll empty a house yeah can you describe the bar the decor the aesthetic 
you know, the, the sort of vibe with the patrons. Uh, and if it, you know, I, I realized you were hanging out there for, you know, a decade plus to some extent. So yeah. I'm sure it changed, but what was it like? Oh, uh, it, it was actually two different uh, bars, two different environments. The daytime bar, we'd went and sit and watch baseball and sports and stuff with the pensioners that lived in the area. We had Harry the Horse, we had Big Al, um, the, the cast of characters was amazing. And then about 9.30, the switchover would start, and the young crowd would come in to see the music and the bands, the pensioners would go home. <laughs> And then the music started, and, and like I said, Ramona just brought in the best bands, and it was so it was really kind of two environments: daytime and nighttime. Maybe I, I want to ask you about Bobby. Greek fishing hat, I believe. Um, I always thought of him to be a nice, uh, a nice man. I always liked him, and uh, very gracious. But uh, how to describe Bobby? <laughs> I, I meant, I believe Sandra, who was kind of. I don't know, girlfriend, a friend, that, a, a lady friend of his that kind of helped him out. Um, I don't think he actually worked at the bar, but she was always there helping him out. He had his friends with him. Um, it was one truck driving lady, a, a rough old lady. I can't remember her name. But these were the characters that, that were friends with Bobby. And like I said, I have fond memories of Bobby. Did these people ever... Uh, uh... You know, did Bobby or or any of his of his pals? I mean, were they into the music? Did they come to shows? Like, do you have a memory of them seeing some band and unexpectedly, you know, like loving the White Trash debutantes or something? No, I don't recall because those concert nights were pretty packed, pretty raucous. Um, yeah, you're, you're more keeping your eye on everything. I, I think they'd stop down once in a while. I think Bobby would come down once in a while and have a look, and then go upstairs. He had no problem hearing the band because his room was right above the stage. So, <laughs> and, and I know that famous room, I, I was able to spend several nights there um, after it passed on and then Jimmy had taken over. So uh, it was always nice to be able to spend the night at the bar, you know. What how did the Blue Lamp fit into the informal Tenderloin circuit and, and what did it mean specifically to the Tenderloin community as, as far as you could tell? Oh, um, yeah, I think it did play an important role. I, was, I, I lived in the Tenderloin from 1982, approximately, until I uh, left in, anyways, 25 years later. I was, I was there for 25 years. Um, it, it really was community. The daytime was, like I said, locals hanging out, and um, it was our community center. We all just go and hang there. Um, the 89 earthquake we were all gathering to watch the baseball game um, that kind of thing now when the earthquake quake hit we kind of all stuck together and watched out for each other um, and yeah had a sense of a community community center feel um, the other bars did not weren't nearly as attractive to us younger people um, but the blue lamp had an attraction i think ramona brought in and, and Rachel carried on, and, and the other girls that uh, Eileen was working there regularly. Um, and then after Rachel, eventually I took over the booking. Um, wow. Yeah, and uh, that was quite a job to do. Uh, there was a change in ownership. Uh, Bobby, the original owner, has, was getting very sick. He brought in his sister, Sally, who brought in her son, uh, Jimmy Stoner, to actually run the place. And uh, things kind of changed then, but stayed the same. And about that time, I took over the booking. And I, when I, when I took over booking, I just followed what she did. She was, I used her as a mentor, you might say. She had so what, with them. How would you describe what she did? What, what was the Ramona booking philosophy? She had the greatest taste in the band. She was bringing in the most wonderful bands. She had the Merman come in. She had the... Uh, all the white trash demi debutantes come in, just really off the wall, unexpected bands. Um, I think our blues jam was somewhat more of the normal thing going on there. <laughs> right. And that reminds me, I, did, I that Monday night acoustic thing I did called the Acoustic Spotlight. Uh, a little point of fact was, uh, you know, the band Train. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they started out there as a duet, Patrick and Rob, uh, Rob, Rob. They. Yeah. Uh, 
they come in and they play the duet and I'm like, they're really good. And they said, do you mind if we come in every Monday? And I go, no, you guys are great. Come on in. And then they finally put a band together. They asked me to play bass for them, but I, I decided not to. I'd just gotten off the road and was not interested. And uh, so then they asked if they could have a Friday night. So I did a Friday night. They packed the place. They were doing wonderful. Then I had to go away one Friday night for a gig. And I came back and I asked Jimmy, the, the owner, um, how did it go tonight with, with training? And he says, don't ever hire them again. I hate that guy. <laughs> I, think he, I think he was talking about Patrick. <laughs> so I, I couldn't hire them anymore. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. But they, they did well without us. <laughs> I, I've never felt a sense of community like that. Ever, any place I lived, I lived in New York, I lived in suburbs, spent time in Utah. Never have I felt a sense of community as I felt there. Cool. I, I, I love that. I think that's, you know, that's a great place to end. I, I, thank you very much. I'd love to come back and when this pandemic's over. Yeah. I will come back. I hopefully get to meet you in person. Um. So Ginger Coyote, who was a kind of punk personality in San Francisco, um, her band, the White Dress Debutantes, played at the Blue Lamp a lot. And those were kind of special, really fun nights. But also Ginger, you know, um, promoter extraordinaire as she was, she would do her flyering uh, like on the days leading up to the show and would kind of come in to the bar in the afternoons to take a rest, have a soft drink. Um, and then we would gossip. And because I grew up in San Francisco and my brother was in the punk rock scene, I'd known who she was since I was you know, 10 years old. And I remember seeing her at the Mab and at the On Broadway and these different clubs. And um, we had a lot of fun together, just talking. Ginger was, you know, to me, she was part of that culture, and I've actually gotten back in touch with her since um, the excerpt from The Hard Crowd appeared in The New Yorker, and then she read it, and we both just thought, oh my God, the blue lamp. I mean, there's just few of us left to remember that time. Also, in her band was a guy um, named Dave Matheson, who I've lost touch with a long time ago, who played guitar. And he had been um, the gas station attendant at, I think it was a Union 76 station at the corner of 7th and Irving. That gas station is no longer there. When I was growing up, I'm from the inner sunset. And my next door neighbor, Jeannie Hicks, uh, was his girlfriend. And that was her first boyfriend. And we all spent a lot of time together. And he was like this kid who worked at the gas station. And then suddenly, he was, you know, this guy in this really flamboyant band, like wearing spandex and feathers the way they all did. They wore costumes. Um, they had one singer, this very beautiful woman who wore bikini bottoms. And then she put a very long haired wig in between her legs, which was a very funny gesture because it was like she had <laughs> like very long and luxurious pubic hair. Like they were, you know, they were a really exciting, funny band. I understand we're talking about the movie lamp. I like the movie lamp. It was fun. It was a neighborhood bar. I lived in Gar Bush. It was on Gary, so maybe about five blocks from where I lived. And it had rock and roll. Why what did you uh why did you love playing there? The well, it was lamp. close to where I lived, first of all. Second of all, we got paid. It's important. Yeah, when you don't get paid at bars, they were very nice, very kind, very generous. And they gave you drinks. What was the crowd like at the Blue Lamp? Um, a mixture of a lot of young kids, younger people that went in there, musicians. And then there was the uh, old regulars that would come in. And that's the one thing that Bobby did not want to have alienated. Bobby was the owner and I don't think he wanted to have um, any kind of alienation 
with the older people or the regulars coming in, you know, that he didn't want them to feel that they didn't belong there. And they bought alcohol. So, of course, you'd sit and talk with them and they'd offer to buy a good drink. And, of course, you ordered the most expensive drink on the, at the, in the place because you get a percentage of that, of that drink. So the older guy, the older man liked all the girls and stuff and, like, chatted and with them and, and, uh, and flirting and stuff. So we had managed to sell a lot of booze for him. Nice. Ramona may have a different story to that. But <laughs> <laughs> we never rolled anybody. We never, like, I think that the only time that she got a little freaked out is when we had the incense play with us. And Marion started swinging the mic around. And we had some, uh, another, uh, another older woman that was up front watching her and almost, uh, she almost hit her in the head with the mic. So, <laughs> but, uh, can you can you tell us a bit about maybe what you, what you, the uh, what who the white trash debutantes audience was uh, in that in the early '90s and when you were playing in San Francisco and at places like the Blue Lamp? I mean, who were the people that would come see you? Well, all the love the hogs that were lusting after us—that's who came to see us. <laughs> The stud puppets, <laughs> the guys who wanted to get pulled on stage and get stripped and ridden like a pony. <laughs> Was that a regular feature at the White Trash debutante? Yes. Never having women. Uh, we had women as singers and, uh, and players. Never having a woman go-go dancer. It's always men. That sounds pretty fun. I would really love to see this show sometime. Oh yeah, yeah really? <laughs> Who wants to see tits? I want to see dick. <laughs> so I, I see a note here about the Gavin convention story. Can you tell us? What oh yeah, well, that? we played the Gavin report um, happened every year at this St. Francis Hotel. And um, it, it's like DJs come in from all over from all over the country and they have to pay money to get, to, they got badges and stuff and they got to go to all these seminars and stuff. And but I did go to a party at the St. Francis hotel and they had all this free booze and, and um, you could go there and you could hand out flyers for your show. And we played at the blue lamp for one or two Gavin conventions and then the one of then we played at this place called the black rose which there was all these pimps and these trans trans hookers and stuff like that and all these drug addicts that were in there and and we we ended up getting a lot of people from the gavin all they had to do is come down and wear their badge and they got in for free and so there were like all these yuppies and all that stuff that were there drinking and they were having a great time and they were saying, oh yeah, we met you guys up at the St. Francis. So we decided to come see you because you guys were the most fun people that we'd met. And so um, basically it was like a big mishmash of all kinds of people that were there. Sammy from the Blue Chunks like ended up wearing a G-string and playing um saxophone on the bar and every guy liked him in the place so and then uh and then we were dressed up in nurses uniforms and and um i had a big buy me a long island iced tea on it. we had well we all i spray painted buy me a long island iced tea and uh boy did i get a lot of long island iced teas especially from the gavin report people it was fun. It was great. It was a fun show. They we didn't get paid much for playing there. Um, unfortunately, uh, when we uh, played the Blue Lamp, we definitely got paid very good. Ramona was very generous, and she really supported bands. And I really appreciate the fact that there was a club like the Blue Lamp that was like within walking distance where I could go and see live music. And I didn't have to go up to Broadway or, or 
you know, to the Mab or to the Stone or to the on or to the on Broadway and all that. Yeah, I mean, the whole band is so weird. They none of them drink. None of them. I mean, I don't drink anymore either. So, but I still got a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for there sure. Well, well, thank you so much, Ginger. Have a great day. Okay, Thanks. you behave. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. It's the old time San Franciscans, you know, their greeting was always uh, started like this. What's doing? <laughs> my name is uh, Mr. Lucky, my uh, knock around stage name. And uh, my time at the Blue Lamp was uh, earlier than uh, Rachel Kushner's. It was in the very early 80s. Uh, one of the best things about San Francisco in the 80s was there was so much 30s, 40s and 50s still in place. I was uh, doing my segue from uh, my new wave band to becoming a jazz lounge singer. And uh, part of that was making the rounds with uh, Janet Soder on Geary, starting at Powell, which featured uh, several piano bars that catered to the after theater crowd. Uh, my favorite was The Curtain Call, which featured uh, Don Regan uh, behind the piano with a uh, uh, a sparkle paint sign with his name above, and uh, he was a very gracious and inviting host to uh, novice singers and, and intoxicated persons. That was a very popular spot, the curtain call. A couple doors up was Between the Acts, uh, which was an organ featured uh, venue. Uh, Lefty O'Doul's, of course, many of you remember uh, from not long ago, they had uh, a rather rowdy piano bar crowd and the smell of corned beef in the air. Um, there was a small one off the lobby of the Curran Hotel, a small piano bar there. Then there was the airport club further up. And uh, I don't remember much about that place. But, uh, but well, of course, one of our favorites for the featuring the piano was the Redwood Room in the Clift Hotel, which was just a beautiful place uh, until some other tragedy uh, affected it. Uh, and then the last stop. On the left, the blue lamp with its rather faded, dusty, uh, plush look uh, in uh, crimson <laughs> uh, tones and overtones of sort of a place gone by. There was a woman playing an organ in the center of the blue lamp and uh, we'd sing there. And uh, the, the toughest thing I think about this project and uh, sometimes going to the Tenderloin Museum is, uh, you know, so much is gone, you turn the page and, you know, things are just disappeared. I did tour uh, recently with the Matchbook hey. uh, for all these fantastic places and uh, enjoy it while you can, gang, because uh, you blink your eyes and uh, the fun is gone. Except for uh, uh, Jarnell's. Jarnell's, stop in. <laughs> yep. It looks like you've really used the uh, striker spine of the man. <laughs> I know, it's so delirious. Well, uh, great book. It's a great book. I'm really, uh, it's shocking how many places that uh, there used to be and how much fun there were in those few square blocks. And, uh, you know. <laughs> the fun is gone. That's and I, I hung out at Original Joe's like constantly for 30, 40 years actually. So uh, uh, I did ask uh, a friend of mine uh, who knows all about almost every bar in town. He was the bartender at Original Joe's for many years, John Harris. And he remembered it as being sort of a edgy like the bartender lady wore like biker outfits and uh, that, you know, it had, had a rough and ready feel to it even back, uh, back into the 80s and the 70s. Uh, there was a biker bartender named Judy there, he said. And uh, it was the kind of place that Nick and Nora used to go to <laughs> when it first opened <laughs> because it had a touch of class to it, but uh, you know, that had faded away. Uh, by the time the 70s and 80s had, like, you know, much of the tempo. Uh, what, were, what were some of the songs maybe you would have 
been singing, you know, at the Blue Lamp or at the Curtain Call or like what was the sort of repertoire? Oh, well, jazz standards, like uh, Tenderly. I remember Don Regan helping me with some lyrics on that. <laughs> um, I knew a lot of songs then. I, I, right after that, I started to group me and a piano player, the Ringing Duo. And we did like, you know, maybe 30 songs out of the Great American Songbook. There's no business like show business. That was one of my big hits. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, when did you start playing music? And like what musical experience shaped Mr. Lucky into what he is? Well, I had, uh, I got to San Francisco in 76. I had a punk band called Pressure, uh, which is sort of a blue collar uh, thing. I was painting signs and billboards and was banging on anvils uh, with hammers with the music. Then the punk scene got sort of like rough and weird and a little bit violent. And then I switched to New Wave. I had a band called Ritharama that, uh, put out uh, two 45s that got some national airplay from Dr. Demento and this and that. We played a lot of big time gigs uh, with both those bands down in LA and around, open for you know X and a bunch of big time bands. Played at all the venues. And then I decided to switch to more of being a lounge jazz singer. Uh, did you know, like beatnik folk songs with one act. Uh, and then uh, with the ring ding duo doing standards. And back then to have some young, youngish guy, I remember I was in my late twenties uh, in a shark skin suit, making a martini on stage singing standards was really unusual. Nobody else in my age group, I mean, did anything like that. So I had, uh, it was almost like a performance art thing. I was invited to sing at you know, the Art Institute and open for different bands and, uh, and so that became, then that got more and more popular at a club called uh, the Club Nine, where the stud just closed. Stud was, it was twice as big. I restored my 1961 Chrysler New Yorker with the big tail fins, and I drove right into the nightclub with the dancing girls, and we called the act Mr. Lucky, and it was mentioned in Herb Kane, and uh, that's when the Mr. Lucky thing you know, got rolling. And uh, it got more and more popular. The swing era in the 90s came in. And uh, that was really the way it evolved. And I certainly didn't expect it to keep going to this day. I've got a great band now, Mr. Lucky and the Cocktail Party with incredible musicians. And we recently played uh, before everything shut down, of course, at the Flower Piano, Golden Gate Park, and a lot of things. So, uh, well, describe for us that never got to go to the Blue Lamp, like the experience of getting to be there. Like, what was the vibe like? Um, yeah, in the 90s, uh, a fellow from my band, the Miss Olgi Experience, started a band, the Good Feeling Band. And so I started going there again in the mid 90s, and uh. It was uh, sort of edgy. It was the kind of carpet I think you at least saw you step in the step in it and be sort of sticky when you pulled your foot back out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, it still had that uh, that dusty uh, crimson feel to it. Uh, it was smoky, <laughs> and uh, it's sort of a rough and ready crowd in there. Uh, certainly uh, in the nineties. Because it was, uh, you know, it was the Johnny Nitro scene and the Good Feeling Band was sort of a, that was the Good Feeling Band. They were like the uh, optimist band, the happy band that would play there. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd, it wasn't a place where you had to like, you know, watch your wallet or your purse really, but uh, you had to watch your back, you know, leaving the place for sure. <laughs> The, and my punk band played in the Tenderloin at the Sound of Music. And I did a bunch of shows at Club Generic on Leavenworth, Steve Parr's place. And uh, that's right. my story. 
there's a great photo of you that's uh, a, a, a photo of you uh, taking a picture that's uh, at the Blue Lamb. Oh. That he sent over. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, I think, Dave Murray on stage and Jaffe and, and Gates and uh, that's a good shot of the place. Yeah, they had the books. I had forgotten about the books. Mike Jaffe, uh, I'm a private investigator in San Francisco, still in the city, uh, out in the sunset. And uh, I was in a band called the Good Feeling Band that played uh, quite a bit at the Blue Lamp in the mid nineties. Um, and I'm thrilled that, to see that you're uh, profiling the Blue Lamp, remembering what was a, a, a unique and, uh, and fun place. Yeah, once we started, well, Rachel gave us the idea for sure. And then once we started to look deeper, it seems like it's pretty much the coolest place ever. Um, what kind of music was the Good Feeling Band? How would you describe it? Well, the Good Feeling Band was uh, originally described as jangly college rock. <laughs> and, and, and I think laughing is the right response. We, we meant for it to be sort of a tongue in cheek style of band where, you know, what we remembered from our college days, the earnest, sincere, uh, you know, folk rock kind of band that you would see in your college town. And there was a bunch of songs that I had written um, myself and with friends that sort of were the foundation of that band. And then we sort of progressed to um, bringing uh, Laura Davidson, whose nickname was Giggs, into the band. And she was a singer songwriter with a tremendous voice. And she had her own, you know, more sincerely sincere songs. And uh, we adapted that to our band. And it was a really excellent fit, um, you know, having our band sort of support her music and playing the other, the other tunes that we had written and that we wrote as the band progressed. Um, nowadays, it might be called Americana or Jangle Pop. You know, I was thinking about categories and, and you know, in retrospect, uh, I can, you know, I can compare to other bands and to, to a, a certain genre. Um, Sounds but, like yeah. a lot of fun. It was it was a fun band and it didn't have a real edge to it as some of this other stuff like I, I seem to recall the White Trash Debutantes probably put on a different kind of show than the Good Feeling Band. I think they were pretty it was, wild. It was yeah. enjoyable and we liked it and people came so you know. Yeah. Um, but we ended up at the Blue Lamp uh, with the band as a you know as a place that bands could play. It, you know there were you know there was a lot of places to play and and uh, you know we played at a variety of venues around town. And the Blue Lamp was, you know, just perfect for a band our size, a smaller band. We were an offshoot of another band, the Psychedelic Lounge Cats, um, that uh, played, a, you know, a little more notably, uh, with more notoriety at, you know, the Paradise Lounge uh, on the big stage. We would play the upstairs of the Paradise with the Good Feeling Band. And, uh, you know, there were places like Nightbreak and Boomerang on Hate Street. Um, and uh, we played the El Rio in the Mission and Hotel Utah. Um, and this, the upstairs room at the Paradise was a regular spot for us. That and the Blue Lamp were really the two places we got to gig the most. And uh, they were both great small little rooms. Now the Paradise upstairs was part of a larger venue and, and lots of bands and you know many bands aspired to be on the bigger stages. Um, the Blue Lamp, the you know, the room was the whole thing and it was a great place to get to play. Um, you know, we were sort of a bar band that fit the, the environment and uh, you would get, as you said, the, this combination of people from the neighborhood who friends of the band or followers of the band who came to see the show, um, tourists, you know, who would, you know, brave the few blocks from Union Square and their hotels, I'm guessing that they were advised at the hotel to come, um, you know, to a place where there's a, a, a scene going on and, and uh, live music, because there would always be people, you know, and in San Francisco being the city that it is, international um, tourists from, from all over the world that you'd end up getting to play for, you know, and it was usually packed as, you know, not a, not a very big room to pack. So that, that there was that advantage. And that's always fun when you're in a band is to, get to play for a, a big room of people that are enjoying themselves. 
Yeah, try to describe for someone like me that never got to go, like what the general like vibe was of the bar. Well, you know, it it was it definitely, you know, had this tenderloin thing. It was down and dirty, but it also was a refuge in a way, you know, once you're in the place, um, you know, you weren't in this, you know, uh, quote unquote dangerous neighborhood. You know, it was always a, a nice place to be and, and to hang out with with like minded people that were enjoying being at a bar and and, and playing or, or or hearing music. Um, it was very lived in and worn. It had uh, these like this wallpaper that was almost like upholstery. Um, and I know there's there's photographs that I, I gave you that show some of that environment, a big mirror behind the stage, the furniture was sort of a hodgepodge of seemed like whatever they found, you know, like, uh, but, uh, you know, like, it was like being in someone's uh, lived in living room or rec room where they just kind of threw the old furniture. And there was a bookshelf with books. Uh, I remember they had a pool table. I remember a, a chandelier covered in dust, like that had never been cleaned. I'm pretty sure that was at the blue lamp. And it, even if it wasn't that, that idea of, you know, things in the corners and hanging from the ceiling that just never got paid attention to. Um, and that was all part of the charm. You know, it was a real uh, place with character. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I know it's been mentioned that Rachel Kushner was the bartender um, and she wrote about it and that's part of the presentation. Uh, I found her books somehow and I read The Mars Room and it yeah. was so familiar to me, um, probably, you know, because of how, how excellent of a writer she is and her portrayal of San Francisco. Um, and then to find out now that she was at the Blue Lamp, you know, uh, established there uh, working um, and I'm sure we crossed paths. I mean, it's, it's an incredible, uh, I don't know, sense of deja vu or, or you know, uh, what, a, what a small world feeling um, because really, you know, her writing spoke to me in, in a way that was so familiar, you know? That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, for, I loved The Mars Room and when I first got to read like the hard crowd essay in The New Yorker, it was just so endlessly fascinating to feel like I got to see like where that fiction came from. Yeah, no, and you know, it's like it was our place, you know, even not being a regular, the fact that they welcomed the band and let us play there a bunch of times, um, you know, it, it felt it felt like a home for us. And we always looked forward to it. Members of the band referred to uh, rocking the lamp. We're gonna <laughs> rock the lamp, you know, and every time we booked a new, a new engagement there, that would be the, you know, hey, another chance to rock the lamp. And we didn't have a phrase like that for other, um, for other venues. I, I uh, recently, since I've been through all my photos, po sent one of the photos um, as a birthday message to one of the band members gigs. And her response was uh, what I wouldn't give to rock the lamp again. You know, it was right there at the tip of her tongue. <laughs> so yeah, that's Leve Smith. I can't remember her real name, which is not Leve Smith. So they still very much regularly performed at the Blue Lamp when I was working there. And um, it was really exciting when they did for a lot of reasons. First of all, she's incredibly talented and so glamorous and has an amazing voice. And she had top-notch musicians playing in her band. It was a multi-set um a multi-piece band. I don't remember, I mean, there might've been nine or 10 people on stage. Um, they had a very um, passionate crowd. So when they played, the place was packed, which also, you know, for us, you make really good money when you've got Lave Smith playing. But I think the most important thing about those nights when she and her band played was that she brought an old fashioned dignity to that bar that almost reinvented what it was right before my eyes. It was not a seedy place. It wasn't about alcoholism and destruction and the sadder aspects of what it was like to work there somehow vanished in the face of this glamorous woman who was a very serious musician who brought almost like she traveled with her era. 
like it was 1923 when she walked into the bar and she brought that dignity into the room. Okay, hi, I'm LeBay. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Alex. Nice to meet Hi, you. Hi, Alex. Let me just um, let me just fix a few things here. And Chris is here with us too. Hi guys. Hi, Hi Chris. Uh, yeah, you wanna you wanna do a tune? Yeah. Sure. Awesome. <laughs> circus movie or something Every <laughs> night, you never knew if somebody was going to get uh you know i mean there was violence that happened outside i saw i saw a woman working the streets pound one of her clients over the head with the end of her high-heeled shoe on new year's eve we did a, a series we started there in 89 uh you guys want a little history behind it or so do you mind if i go or sure you, yeah absolutely I went there first, so I could, but you go ahead. Well, I'll give my, I'll give my story how I met the name, but then you want to, might want to. So I, I had got hired by a band called Bo Grumpus, which was a brilliant guitar player named uh, Craig Ventresco, who did music for the movie Crumb about R. Crumb, the comic book artist. And he's still around town with his uh, partner, Meredith Axelrod, making wonderful music. He was a specialist in early, late 19th century, early 20th century ragtime and blues, kind of a genius. 
and uh, and his drummer Cray, uh, Pete Devine, who lead, who has a wonderful blues band called Hal Devine. That's been, their music has now been put into the Smithsonian uh, archives. And uh, so they were great musicians. They hired me as my first gig ever. That was March of '89. And Craig had been busking in the streets with LeVay, and he brought her in, uh, in July of 89, and the place just went crazy. They, they hired her immediately. All the regulars just loved her, and uh, I'll just stop there, and you can get, ah. get whatever else is up. Well, the, the, I went to the Blue Lamp the first night I moved to town in 1988, and um, I was, you know, one of the things I always say, I was looking to hang out with my grandpa and some of these tenderloin dive bars because he loved in fact the royal cuckoo that my brother owns now is named after the bar my grandpa used to hang out in so i was looking to hang out with grandpa and i sure enough did <laughs> well the first time we came to town we went to the gary club and then the driftwood and then you know i like bars but i'm a lot like chris uh i like i prefer bars with music so i really didn't you know i went to driftwood and then once in a while but I, I like the blue lamp because it had music so the first time we went in there I remember BJ Papa was playing and um, Bishop Norman Williams and they were um, you know virtuoso bebop jazz musicians and it was an all African American band they used to play there every Friday and Saturday this is you know earlier before Ramona even and um, it was so cool like they were, they were you know they were playing Kansas City bebop via Charlie Parker, it was amazing. And then they had blues bands all week long. But the first night I went in there, it was crazy. I remember meeting all kinds of really, I remember some guy told me, he had some older gentleman, I have a reindeer farm and all, we met a lot of cool people. And um, and I ended up meeting my grandpa in the form of this gentleman named Bobby, Bobby Berry, Bobby Berry. He, was a, he said he was a playwright. He wrote Les Mis, and he always requested, play me some saintly blues, saintly blues. And we, it was just cool. There wasn't, there were a few young people in there, but there's a lot of, you know, really interesting characters like Bobby Berry, and they love jazz, and they love music. Um, and they really just, went, one lady, uh, Katie, she used to strip down to her big beige bra and show her tattoo on her thigh but she loved blues she had so much fun um and then so what happened was they had blues during the week and I was uh sitting in with the band the blues bands and then they the blues bands took over on the weekend from the jazz band then um then uh, it be then Ramona came in more and she brought it because the as the Neighborhood was, you know, getting a lot more young people because they had a whole, um, they, they were losing people at that time and, and, and just before that. And then they started, when I moved to town, they had a loss of new people. City as a yeah, the whole, the city as a whole. And then I was some of the, we were some of the new people who came in and it started to fill up the tender line with 20 somethings. So that was really nice. They, so a lot of them, so then they started to book more rock and roll and stuff, but we still played there on the weekends for a while. And we just loved it so much. Ramona did such a great job and Bobby Berry uh, and also Bobby, the owner, Gretchen, they were all. And then of course uh, they had the Peruvian shaman who lived in the basement and uh, Manuel. So they had a lot of interesting characters for sure. <laughs> that's all, I think that's my story. Well, yeah. tell us more about um, Manuel. <laughs> yeah. let's stop but, you right there at peruvian shaman in the basement i've yeah. not heard he's about that person <laughs> before. I mean, well, he was a shaman he was uh well he, they, i don't know what the latest words are so i don't want to disrespect anybody but he had both parts you know wow. man and female so he was a very special person <laughs> he was blessed intersex and, uh, pardon intersex intersex okay that's what okay thank you and uh, so he was intersex and he was cool real sweet gentleman um he they had a basement uh and I remember chris, chris bought a leather jacket from it real cute one really cute <laughs> it was cheap too five bucks we were you know we were living on a shoestring and you didn't it, in the, look in the city in those days was so different we had three of us in an apartment around the corner from the blue lamp we were on high no feral and we paid 175 each and we were happy as could be you know it was, it was just great and it was a great time for musicians and artists to be in the city uh you could afford it there was all kinds of music all kinds of venues all kinds of places to play all kinds of arts happening 
But you know, when LeMay was was so popular uh, at the Blue Lamp with the with the regulars, with the Tenderloin, you know, neighborhood folks, and then younger people started to discover it too, and, and people from other venues came, and and someone from the Paradise Lounge, which was a really big venue in those days, one of the main rock venues on 11th and Folsom before Slim's opened up, it was like the main South of Market Club. They came and hired, they loved LeMay, they hired our band. And, you know, to, in order to get a good crowd, she invited all the Tenderloin regulars and half of them got kicked out of the Paradise Lounge because they weren't used to that type of a crowd. This is a pretty Yeah, they got pretty pissed rough at us and, and brought in our crowd and they were a little too rough and tumble for <laughs> Paradise Lounge. <laughs> tenderloin, tenderloin <laughs> folks, you know. That's uh, awesome. Why, why did you, what did you love about the Blue Lamp? What did you love about playing there? Well, I love that it was, uh, you know, it was a tender, it was a dive bar, but it had lots of elegance, quiet elegance, like it had a velvet ceiling that was kind of, uh, kind you of know, billowed down, yeah. it hung down a little bit. Yeah. And then it had a fireplace. I remember this one guy, I loved him so much, Joseph Cheney. He was so talkative, tall African American gentleman with, you know, not a huge afro, but big enough that it could have caught on fire when he lit his cigarette in the, um, in the fireplace. <laughs> yeah. He was a real character. He loved the music too. So I love the fireplace. I didn't like that Joseph's hair got on fire, but hey, that's going to happen when you put your head in it to light a cigarette. He hung out there. My sister was a bartender there. We used to hang out there all day long and she would give us, we drink blue light coffee all day. We loved it. And we hung out with the regulars, but we wouldn't be hanging out necessarily. We, we rehearsed there. Like uh, we rehearsed there with Joe and Riz and uh, we would just jam all, you know, all day long getting our songs together. So it was kind of like a nice workshop too. Yeah, there was kind of community, you know, I mean, it was, it was down home and it was, it was unpretentious. And it was certainly everybody was accepted unless they really got out of hand, you know. <laughs> and so, so, so a pretty diverse crowd of people. And, and uh, it was a different time in San Francisco. And, and I think also one of the things that was great about it was they really were music oriented. Not every bar, as they said, is music oriented. But they had music all the yeah. time. And of course, Ramona was a huge music lover. And she went on. You guys know Ramona who did the bottom of the hill? Yeah. yeah so we, we, inter we had the pleasure of interviewing her as well. Oh, that's I, great. Ramona was so glamorous and, you know, uh, she was a little bit older than us, but we never knew because she was, she just, she skateboarded and she was just so beautiful. You know, we, we thought we were like 21. She wasn't, she was just a little bit older than us, maybe 10 years older. I can't remember, but she was so glamorous and cool. I was like, oh, and she had great taste in music too. All, she booked all kinds of interesting, fun bands uh, as well. Owners like Bobby, they're not around anymore. <laughs> Bobby Blue Lamp, that, that he, they're not around anymore. He was a really, he was about this tall Irishman, always wore a cap. <laughs> yeah, kind of nautical cap, right? Yeah, nautical yeah. cap. You know, uh, he, he never really hung out and enjoyed the music. I think he had extra, you know, he had another kind of life. <laughs> but he wasn't, he was just in it. I would say he enjoyed having a bar, but he was just in it for the money. <laughs> But he gave Ramona free brain yeah, with the music. Yeah. You know, he let the people just do the music the way they wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I think he liked the music, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he Not did, so much. He, no, he no. really didn't hang out that much for the music. I never seen him really, you know. But um, and before Ramona, it was Karen. I remember Karen. We called her Karen Blue Lamp. Karen she, who started the Chameleon, which became Amnesia in the Mission. Oh, yeah. yeah. But one thing I wanted to talk about was the Blue Lamp jukebox. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. It had 45s and they were, you know, like roll, roll with me, Henry, dance with me, and you know, all this. I mean, roll with me, Henry by Etta James for like her first big hit. Right? Yeah. It had all kinds of good, you know, Shotgun oh. by Junior Walker, all kinds of good music. It was like, hey, I got to give it up to Bobby for that. And he had some good records on that jukebox. Wasn't there a, a, a version of Don't Get Around Much Anymore? I know got played Probably, a lot. Yeah, I seem to remember that. Yeah. There, uh, really, the, the most interesting character for me was Bobby Berry, the playwright. Well, he was a I'll try to find some pictures. I've got pictures from the Blue Lamp with him and all those people. <laughs> he was a self described playwright. He's from the Bowery, New York. He had this incredible voice, you know, and, and, uh, and he drank a lot. And he would claim that he wrote the play Les, Les, Les Miserables and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> And people who were around those days still talk. We talk about Pete still remembers him. He had that real whiskey voice. 
Jill, I love you. The St. Louis Blues, he'd climb up on the table, you know, I'd be shouting and shaking. And one time we ran into him and he had been sober for a while. His voice had completely changed. He didn't have any of that rasp to it. He looked well. like a little bit like Marty Feldman, too. But Burgess sure. Meredith, I always thought, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Say, you know? It seemed like, though, when we first started playing the Blue Lamp with Craig and Pete, because Craig was such a virtuoso, uh, like Blind, Blind Blake, you know, he sounded like the guitar players on Bessie Smith Records. And so we definitely had more of a 20s sound. And I hired uh, the first gig we had there, Oscar Meyer, trumpet player, who's uh, famous for, you know, hanging out at, well, in the Boom Boom Room. He had, he has a band that played there. And I had seen him at the Gold Dust Lounge and uh, playing St. Louis Blues. And then one time I was on the bus, 38, going to Vesuvio's to work. And I saw him. I'm like, oh my God, you're the guy. You're the guy. And um, he gave me his card and I hired him. I said, I got a gig. And he, he showed up all dressed up. He was 45 years old and um, he always dressed up and he always encouraged the rest of us. In fact, he often told us, this band needs uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> so it was him, Chris was on piano, Craig and Pete Devine on drums. There was no bass player for the first gig. And, um, you know, Craig and, and between Craig and Chris, it just worked out wonderful. So that was our first, and we did a lot of blues and boogies and stuff from the 20s, like and Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. Um, that song I sang, Blue Spirit Blues, lots of Bessie Smith um, numbers. And But it always had a, the thing that um, what Chris brought up is uh, we would do maybe later some stuff that wasn't from the 20s, but it would always have a feminist theme, you know, maybe it was a boogie woogie from the 40s, you know. <laughs> So we would dip into the 40s and the 50s with the with the blues, but it was usually always blues and a feminist based music theme. Yeah. Yep. What was the Tenderloin like at that time? Oh, see, it was uh, very cheap, affordable, um, really fun. Uh, lots of uh, dive bars. That's why I moved there. I remember, I remember seeing. Um, this big, now it was an Indian restaurant, but they had this big martini glass, the Ritz uh, on Jones, right near the blue lamp. And I just love all the neon. And so there was lots of neon and just people hanging out. Uh, I feel like, it, you know, it, it was it, in some ways, it's a lot, a lot like it is now. Obviously, a lot of the, the dive bars have been taken over and turned into higher end places and stuff. And, and so there's been, and there's been people who've moved in with higher incomes, but a lot of low income people, a lot of a lot of working class people. I, I don't remember nearly the amount of homelessness. I, I don't know. I think that must be a factor of the fact that rents have gone so up so much. I mean, considering yeah. that we could live there, you know, as in, in our early 20s at, for 175 a month, I think it was just a lot easier for people on a very low income to be able to afford to live in the tenor law, you know. And so it's so I mean, when I walked through the tenor or I've actually walked through the tenor law in quite a while during the pandemic, but driven through it a couple of times it's just it just breaks your heart to see the the the, the amount of people out on the street now you know, it's a big difference also all the people like who live in our building it was so cool they were always just it was always interesting all we had this guy who lived in the basement mr matthews now mr matthews he couldn't live it that that basement apartment you know, even Mr. Matthews couldn't afford it, yeah. and it, we had a lot of just oh interesting God. characters in the in the whole in the place was, you know, just always interesting. Always like, oh my God, did you see Mr. Ed, or did you see, um, you know, just a lot of the people were were real. They don't those kind of people. I miss those people. They, we don't really have those kind of people in around anymore. It's all like I was walking down uh, Valencia the other day. It's all young people, and uh, I like old people too. <laughs> I wish we had more. Me too. Um, you know, we always had a lot of older people in our band. Like the age range in our band at any given point went from twenty to eighty, and we toured the country with folks who were in their in their seventies and even early eighties. And, and you know, we've always enjoyed hanging around older folks. And there were a lot of older folks at the Blue Lamp and, and, um, and some of our fans too, you know. Hello, we're back. Thanks so much for staying, uh, staying with us for this great event. And we're fans of Ove and Chris. They were yeah. so fun to talk to and amazing musicians. So virtual clap. <laughs> see them at, go see them at the uh, Royal Cuckoo Organ Lounge and the, the Marketplace.
Um, we're going to have uh, Leve and Chris do one more song to kind of play us out. So uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Um, check out future events at the museum. You can learn more at tenderloinmuseum.org. Thanks media. to everyone who uh, interviewed with us and sent us photos and flyers and uh, business cards and matchbooks and thank you so much. Yeah, and big shout out to Dave Glass. I, I don't know if I mentioned him in the, the interlude there, was talking in the chat some, but uh, his photos were, were uh, uh, amazing and we used a bunch of them for our promo and uh, you saw them throughout the event tonight. So thanks to Dave Glass. Thanks to Leslie Michelle. Uh, thanks to City Lights for hooking us up with some books uh, to have at the, uh, at the museum. Um, looking forward to seeing everyone in person soon. If I call three times a day, baby, Come and drive my blues away. Will I call? Be ready to play and do your duty. If you wanna have some love, give your baby your last buck. Don't come quacking like a duck and do your duty. I heard you say you didn't love me, baby. Yesterday I miss his brown. I don't believe a word she said. She is the lightest woman in town. Oh, babe, I'm not trying to make you feel blue. I'm not satisfied with the way you do. I gotta help you find somebody to and do your duty. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah.